morning. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon. This is Lauren Wenzel from the National Marine Protected Area Center at NOAA, and happy to welcome you to another in the series of MPA webinars with Open Channels and with EBM Tools Network. And today we're uh, very happy to welcome David Gill, who is a David H. Smith Fellow with Conservation International in George Mason University. And he is going to be talking about how capacity shortfalls hinder the performance of marine protected areas globally. So I will give you a little background on David in just a moment. But before I do, I just wanted to remind you all of how we run these webinars. We encourage you to use the question box to ask your questions. Uh, you don't have to wait until the presentation is over. Go ahead and ask those questions. And then David will go ahead and make his presentation. And then after that, we will facilitate a Q&A so we can get to as many of your questions as possible. So uh, please, please feel free to ask your questions or make your comments as we go through. So I'm going to uh, introduce David now. He uh, has been very busy with this research that you're about to hear and with completing his PhD. The current research focuses on linkages between marine protected area governance, human well-being, and ecosystem health. And you're going to be hearing a lot more about that. That has been spearheaded by World Wildlife Fund and aims to inform marine conservation policy and strengthen a culture of evaluation in the conservation sector. He recently completed his PhD, which was entitled The Economic Value of Reef Fishes to the Fishing and Dive Tourism Industries in the Caribbean. Uh, and uh, he, before that, he completed his Master's in Natural Resources Management at the Center for Resource Management and Environmental Studies uh, in the West Indies in, Barbado, in Barbados. So David, welcome, and I will turn it over to you. Hey, thank you for the introduction. So thank you uh, for this opportunity. I'm just going to use this to give uh, everyone a brief overview of some of the work that represents um, a project, an initiative that's been going on for the past four years, um, which I joined about two years ago. I'm doing a postdoc um, with the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center and the Luke Hoffman Institute. And this work, uh, we recently got it published in Nature last month. Um, and if any of you get, need a link to the paper, you can just let me know. Okay, so... Um, just a brief overview of the impetus for the project. And so we know that millions, if not billions of people around the world depend on marine resources for food and their livelihoods. However, these resources are being threatened by human activities. In response, the global conservation community have invested millions of dollars in marine conservation, particularly um, in marine protected areas. And part of this has been driven by the international biodiversity targets, um, the Aichi targets, uh, where in 2011, 193 countries agreed that in addition to protecting their land areas, that by 2020, that they protect 10% of their coastal and marine areas in uh, protected areas that are effectively and equitably managed. Uh, Part of this goal is also repeated in Goal 14 of the Sustainable Development Goals, um, where the 10% target um, by 2020 is repeated. And so as a result, we have seen um, the ocean um, tr being transformed. And so it, basically from 1996, so roughly 20 years ago, the ocean went from looking like this um, to looking like this in 2016, where we have uh, about 14 and a half million square kilometers of marine protected of the ocean within marine protected areas or other forms of um, marine protection. This equates to roughly 4.1% um, of the world's oceans or 10.2 of coastal and marine waters in the terrestrial. In, in terrestrial seas. And so as we continue to progress and we continue to expand on the number and sizes of, of MPAs around the world, uh, we have to ask some questions about how these MPAs are actually doing. Um, are they achieving their, uh, their social and ecological objectives? 
And if they're not achieving their objectives, why, why not? And these are the questions that um, this research project sought to answer. Um, basically, we thought we had three major questions that we, we asked to get a better understanding of what's going on in MPAs globally. So the first question is figure out how are MPAs being managed and are they being managed effectively and actively as outlined within the global conservation target. Uh, what are the impacts on fish populations? And do we, can we draw linkages between how marine protected areas are being managed and their result in ecological impacts? And so this work uh, represents a collaboration between many different institutions whose logo can't all fit on the slide. Uh, and some of the members of the team are shown in the picture on the right, and the principal investigators are Helen Fox. Um, she's currently uh, with National Geographic and Michael Massey of um, Conservation International. Uh, this, this project represents just a segment of the work that they have been doing uh, on marine protected areas uh, where there are also other components where they're doing in on-ground work in Indonesia as well. So to answer the first question about how MPAs are being managed, we drew on social theory from governance and management and organizational theory to identify 10 indicators of effective and equitable management. And as for data sources, uh, we pulled from various um, national and international data sets, most of them from funding agencies, NGOs, and other regional partners. With these assessments, we were able to compile about 750 in 433 MPAs around the world. Um, this is in roughly 70 countries around um, globally. And to give you a snapshot of the results, we found that most MPAs are, had legislative support. Um, they were legally gazetted. And, at 69 percent, the majority of them had appropriate regulations uh, regarding sustainable use. However, in terms of capacity, only 35 percent said that they had an acceptable budget and only 9 percent said that they had adequate staff capacity to carry out critical management activities. Uh, just under a third said that they had clearly defined boundaries that were well known to the stakeholders and 45% said that they had acceptable enforcement capacity. In terms of management, uh, in terms of who is involved in management and decision making, um, we found that 80% of the MPAs were managed by state agencies only, and only about half of the MPAs said that local stakeholders had direct involvement in decision making. And so this potentially points that um, so the fact that there may be inequitable um, processes going on with regards to decision making in MPAs. For the second question, to get an understanding of the impacts of MPAs on fish populations, uh, we again relied on multiple data providers from around the world, um, many of which we uh, collect were from underwater fish, conducted underwater fish surveys. Uh, in the Caribbean and elsewhere around the world. And so with these data sets, uh, we were able to collect um, fish survey data uh, under, from underwater visual censuses uh, from the species level or at the site level in just under 16,000 sites around the world. We then supplemented these data with um, a recent meta-analysis that was done by Sarah Lester on both no-take MPAs and MPAs without allowed fishing activity. And so with the, all these data on fish survey sites, we then sought to identify M their, the impacts of MPAs on fish populations. And we are using fish biomass as the indicator of MPA impacts, and where we are comparing MPA to non-MPA locations. So either um, locations where before the MPA was established or um, outside of the MPA. However, uh, in doing this, you run into a, 
a series of problems. First of all, when you're comparing MPA to non-MPA sites, you run into significant biases in the data. Uh, first of all, uh, because MPAs are not randomly placed in the ocean, they are placed in play often where it's easy to, uh, to establish an MPA where there's little political resistance. And so this is why we find many remote large MPAs. We also find MPAs where there's high biodiversity or high tourism value. And so when you're comparing MPA to non-MPA sites, you automatically have other differences between those fish populations that are not a result of the MPA. You also have other confounding factors when you're comparing two sites over space and time um, in terms of oceanographic conditions, the social environment, and other changes that might have happened in between uh, the two, in between when the surveys were done, both in terms of time and space. And so, um, using this high-resolution map, <laughs> um, if we were to compare fish populations uh, within the MPA on the, the right um, to those out here on the left, uh, we would prob this will probably give us many results that are not, uh, the difference between the two may be a result of many other factors other than one being inside an MPA and one being outside what we would need to be doing is comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges or bananas to bananas. <laughs> um, this will allow us then to control for the differences, um, for example, being near shore, uh, being associated with a specific habitat. And so to do this, uh, we drew on methods that are um, used in impact evaluation and economics and the development health sector, where uh, you have situations where using observation data, you do not have a randomly, a randomly designed control experiment, um, and you, so you have to rely on a quasi-experimental approach to simulate the, that, um, those random controlled experiments. And so uh, we were able to use statistical matching, and you basically use many of the differences that you find between the treatment and the control populations, which is the MPA and non-MPA conditions, um, populations or sites, and we use those to match on. And so um, basically, um, if we have an MPA that's, if we know that distance to shore is an important factor in determining um, what species occur and what fish populations occur at different sites, we match MPAs that were this, uh, based on their distance to shore. We also match MPAs based on the kind of habitat that um, they were um, MPA and non-MPA sites based on the, the kind of habitat as well. And so by matching and reducing the, the differences based on these attributes, we are able to then isolate the effect of the MPA itself. And so here are some of the results uh, after the statistical matching. Uh, we were able to compile data within 218 MPAs around the world, and we report the results as response ratios, which is basically the ratio of fish biomass within the MPA to those outside of the MPA. And we have those that are positive in blue are those where there, have been, there is more fish biomass inside of the MPA as compared to the statistically matched control sites. And if you have a look at the map, you realize that there, there is a lot of variation. However, there's no apparent geographic patterns. And overall, we found that 71% of MPAs had positive impacts on fish populations, and that the percent increase um, from MPA, from non-MPA to MPA locations was greater as expected in locations where fishing was not allowed or no-take areas as compared to those where fishing is allowed. But nonetheless, in both types of MPAs or MPA zones, we find that both on average have positive impacts on fish populations. Okay, so lastly, um, linking MPA management to the resulting ecological impacts. Uh, this, for this, we looked at all 10 of our management indicators as well as other important non-management factors that could help explain the differences that we see in 
the fish biomass response ratios or the fish the the impacts on fish populations and so we use random forest models to get a better understanding of which of these variables explain most of the variation that we see in ecological impacts uh, for our MPAs and so in the 62 MPAs where we had both ecological and management data we find that out of all the different uh, management variables and, and non-management factors as well that staff and adequate staff and budget capacity were the two strongest predictors um, in explaining the variation that we saw in um, ecological impacts as measured by um, differences in fish biomass. This difference was so strong that it did not matter if the MPA uh, was allowed fishing, uh, which is in the light blue or multi-use MPA or MPA zone, or in MPAs where fishing was prohibited. In both cases, um, MPAs where there was adequate staff capacity had impacts that were much stronger than those where they reported none or inadequate staff capacity. And the difference here is almost uh, three times as much on the log scale. And this is of concern uh, because, as I mentioned earlier, we found that most MPAs reported either none in light blue or inadequate or below optimal staff capacity um, in blue. And that very few MPAs have reported that they had adequate staff capacity. So overall, uh, we find that many MPAs around the world are reporting um, that they have ineffective and potentially inequitable management processes. But nonetheless, um, on average, the ecological impacts are positive, but, uh, but diverse. And that they re some of this diversity and some of this variation in ecological impacts um, is strongly explained by available staff and financial capacity within the MPAs in our study, um, in the, the 62 MPAs where we had both, both management and ecological data, um, staff capacity alone explained 19% of the variation that we saw in ecological impacts. And because of the global capacity shortfall that we noticed globally, um, there is a like, strong likelihood that inadequate staff capacity is hindering MPAs from reaching their full potential. Another point of concern that comes up is that if we continue to expand MPAs uh, without adequately investing in capacity, we may run the risk of diluting the available staff resources. And what I mean is that if you have very limited capacity to manage one MPA as you continue to expand either in terms of number of sizes of that MPA without um, the simultaneous investment capacity, you will be diluting those management resources over larger areas. And so we need to ensure that as we continue to expand uh, the number and sizes of MPAs, that we are also at the same time adequately investing in the available capacity. Another major finding of our research was what we didn't find, <laughs> and that was um, data on the social impacts of MPAs. How are coastal communities being affected? Are some groups being affected more or less and benefiting more or less than others? And there's a significant data gap uh, with regards to how coastal communities are being affected by the presence of MPAs. And so that is the current topic of my current postdoc, uh, working with Conservation International, NOAA, Duke University, and George Mason University. We're trying to get an understanding of exactly how marine protected areas are affecting different dimensions of human well-being, both within the U.S. and elsewhere around the world. So overall, uh, the desired outcomes for this work is to give us a better understanding of the relationship between social, ecological, and governance systems within MPAs, and that with the tools and approaches that we develop and use, that we can improve the way how we monitor and evaluate and measure impacts from marine conservation initiatives such as MPAs. 
And with the insights from the results, we hope to provide policy-relevant um, information that will guide conservation to be more effective and to um, more effective and equitable uh, in the future in, with regards to how we govern and manage marine resources. So I want to say thank you to the many co-authors, the main funding agencies, and the many, many, many data providers um, who um, has co contributed um, their resources in terms of their data um, to us to be able to carry out this project. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, David. That was a that was a great presentation, very clear. And a couple of folks have sent in questions, so we'll get to those. And I encourage others to go ahead and send in their questions. But I wanted to start with um, how you selected the sites that you examined. Uh, can you say a little bit about how you did that? Okay. Uh, they, the, we went where they were the data were available and so um, the project when the project started uh, they uh, they the lead author the principal investigators had identified a few data sets um, both in terms of management data and ecological data uh, but realized soon that the that, that was not enough and so uh, we spent a considerable amount of time reaching out to the various funding agencies, um, the NGOs, data, regional data provider collectors and managers for both ecological and management data, and um, so basically the work, the what we have is is a product of where the data were available. Okay, I know there was one question about uh, the California MPA system and, and why that wasn't included in there. Is that because there was uh, not sufficient ecological data at the time? Um, the California MPA system, uh, we, we did have ecological, some ecological data from California. However, it's not some of the more recent data. Um, and the other, the other side of this is that we had to ensure that we had, because we were combining many different types of both management and ecological data, that they were comparable. And so, for example, for the management data, um, for each indicator, um, whether it be um, indicator for staff capacity, for, um, for how to, uh, clearly defined boundaries, we had to ensure that the questions that were being asked were, were lined up exactly with that of the other assessments. And so in, in many cases, we were unable to use other assessments just because we wanted to ensure we had that sort of construct validity um, between the different um, sur survey instruments on the management side. Uh, on the ecological side, um, one constraint was that we had to have um, appropriate non-NPA um, conditions and non-NPA data. And so we were unable to get data for um, quite a few of the U.S. sites at the time. Okay, thanks. There are quite a few questions about what do you mean by adequate staffing. Can you say more about that? Okay. And so, yeah, as I... So the management data were sourced from the various, some various management assessments that were conducted or uh, by the both the managers or and stakeholders or um, in the case or in some cases one or the other, and so they were required to provide answers to condition about conditions within their MPAs, and so they were asked questions like, um, do you have enough? Of staff capacity to carry out critical management activities and they responded to Likert based scores which said you know we don't um, it's inadequate it's below optimal uh, or yes we have acceptable staff capacity so the data that are used here are from qualitative um, sources where the managers the stakeholders uh, they responded uh, on on their opinion based on their knowledge their local knowledge within the MPA. Okay, and and were you able to get a better sense of what kinds of capacity the sites were lacking? 
whether it was enforcement or uh, other kinds of roles, you know, community engagement, research? Yes, uh, we did look at some of the other, um, the other content and the descriptions and of what they meant by uh, inadequate capacity. And the interesting thing is that there, we did not see any strong patterns. Um, yes, enforcement was mentioned in some, but community engagement in others, uh, tourism management, um, stakeholder engagement, administration, research and monitoring. And so overall we find that um, within each MPA um, the capacity needs were different, but the, gen the overall and strong trend that we, we see when, um, when looking across the different MPAs is that um, no matter where the, the, the capacity gaps were, um, those that reported having enough, having adequate staff numbers and having adequate uh, financial resources, those were the ones that performed um, better ecologically. And so it, it seems that enforcement was included in the overall category of staff capacity. Is that correct? No, we looked at enforcement separately. Um, so oh, there right. was a separate indicator which looked at um, do the, or is, there, uh, is the amount of enforcement within the MPA um, adequate? And so that was a separate question and that and capacity did not come out as strong as um, overall staff capacity. Okay, so you separated out that. Okay, that's... Yes. Um, and, uh, but, but both the staff capacity and the enforcement capacity were based on the qualitative assessment of the yes. MPA? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, is there any data to support the idea that capacity could be diluted by expansion of marine protected areas or, or how uh, countries are, are addressing uh, expansion and capacity issues? Uh, we don't have data on that. Um, what, what it is is just if we, we see the current trends where many, and especially within the last five years, many large MPAs being established. And so um, there's been a lot of concern, um, both from the work that we're doing and others as well, that we that many countries are focusing heavily on reaching the percentage targets. And so looking at the amount of area that's covered or the amount of area that is um, designated and not as much looking to see, um, looking at the performance of management or the impacts or the outcomes from these MPAs and the quality um, of, of management within the MPAs. And so what we hope that with our work is that we, we bring to light the need to ensure that we, both, we have both quality and quantity to, uh, together um, and not just focus on expanding without adequate consideration um, to the gaps that we already see, the shortfalls that we, we already see that are prevalent in many MPAs around the world. Yeah, well, I think it's excellent point. I, I, I agree with you that there's a lot of emphasis these days on the geographic coverage, meaning the spatial targets of IG-11, and really not as much on the MPA effectiveness component. So do you have any comments or recommendations about how to increase the emphasis on this in global policy discussions? Um, well, fortunately, um, when they were uh, putting together the, the targets, um, they do have the clauses in there um, that these MPAs, need, these protected areas need to be effectively and equitably managed. These MPAs need to be in ecologically representative areas, um, networks. And so the, the language is there, um, however the, for, the focus isn't. And so by bringing to light um, the, need to, um, the need to fo focus on these other aspects of MPAs other than their geographic coverage, the need to, um, to be accountable uh, both to funding agencies, to, to governments, to the local people uh, with regards to what are the actual impacts and the performance of these MPAs. Um, I think it's the way to go. Um, to, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so a couple of questions about how NGOs and community groups um, 
get involved in managing MPAs and can sometimes uh, be incredibly important assets. Were they considered to be staff or were, uh, were staff only considered to be government employees? Uh, yes, um, yes. So the question in this, um, the, some of the questionnaires explicitly um, asked about um, are defined staff as either the paid staff or a community presence. And so, yes, um, communities do have a very strong role in providing um, the, the staff, the, the, the people on the ground, um, especially in communities where there's ownership of the MPAs. Uh, we weren't able to look at that in this study, but from other research, um, definitely in situations where the local community um, supports the MPA, um, especially if there's ownership or initiated, initiated by the local community. Um, where they are able to uh, provide, um, they're then able to be, uh, provide their in-kind services, <laughs> as so to say, to ensure that the MPA is a success and to fill a lot of the, the capacity gaps that cannot be filled by um, simply hiring more staff. So if I understand you, you're saying that uh, the, the question of whether these uh, locally managed or co-managed areas was not a focus of this study, but that other research supports that. Yeah, yeah yes, other, yeah, okay. yeah, other research supports it. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of interest in that. And uh, of course, I think there has been a lot of work to show that critical importance of community engagement in the effectiveness and ecological outcomes associated with MPAs. So here's a question from uh, Matt Love about whether there is an effect of, of the age of an MPA. A well-established and culturally socialized MPA may have a greater effect than a more newly established MPA. Uh, were you able to look at that? We did um, include age, size, um, the amount of the, the proportion of the MPA where fishing was prohibited. We included all of those variables in the analysis. Um, age and size did come out as being um, significant in some of the models. However, um, relatively speaking, they were not as strong as um, the amount of the available capacity within the MPA. Um, we, in the, in the design of the experiments, we also only looked at MPAs or data from MPAs after three years of establishment, so that um, where it would have been likely for the to be in a response in the fish populations. But, um, but yes, they, those two variables did come out as important, but um, in, relatively speaking for the MPAs in our sample, uh, capacity came out as the strongest, the, the strongest variables. I have a question here from Peter Edwards at NOAA uh, who says, given your difficulty in finding data, can you say something about the utility of having both ecological and management and human dimensions information and yeah. the importance of, of integrating this information? Well, yes, <laughs> very important. Um, we, many uh, within the conservation world often promote uh, MPAs as these tools that provide win-wins, social and ecological win-wins, uh, benefit people, benefit nature. However, the, the data on these are on to record or document these kind of impacts are quite limited and scattered. And so the way for us to really understand not only if MPAs are providing these win-wins, and there are some cases that they do, um, but how can we better um, manage MPAs or that to, to, to maximize on both social and ecological outcomes? Um, without data, um, we are relying a lot on anecdotal evidence. And so if we are able to um, systematically collect and compile these different kinds of data, you can see and better understand the trade-offs that occur um, in some MPAs where um, there's ecological benefits but social costs, uh, we get a better, better understanding of why and how management could play a role in mitigating against social impacts or vice versa. Were you surprised that you didn't find more MPAs that had available data across the board from ecological to social? Uh, surprised, no. <laughs> uh, I, and this is why I, I appreciate the, the, the data providers because we know that these data are difficult to collect. Um, and 
and even when we're talking about ecological data, um, the amount of effort that goes into doing underwater visual fish surveys um, is quite a lot of work. And that, but to conduct um, rigorous social assessments um, is even more effort, and it's not been a focus uh, within the marine um, management and conservation world um, until probably the last decade or so. We're seeing a lot more work done on um, social monitoring, and so as this picks up momentum and as we develop um, standardized protocols and ways to conduct social uh, impact monitoring, we will be able to generate these insights, uh, get a better understanding of how we can better manage MPAs to reduce their negative impacts, uh, reduce any potential negative impacts on um, human communities. Well, well, you're heading toward my next question, which is for the MPAs that wish they were in this study but weren't, um, do you have any advice on uh, protocols or sources that they might refer to uh, to pursue some of the more rigorous monitoring that's needed. And I, I guess I would just point out that there was an, an excellent guide, How's My MPA Doing, put out a few years ago, but that may seem rather daunting to people in terms of the, uh, the complexity of the, of the monitoring that it uh, lays out. Uh, yes, how is your MPA doing is one example. Um, the other component of this project, which I mentioned earlier, uh, where they're doing um, some intensive work within the bird's head seascape in Indonesia, in Raja Ampat, and they have developed monitoring protocols for both social ecological and manage for social ecological and management monitoring. Um, I can provide links to those. Um, they're on the MPA Mystery website, mpamystery.org. They provide a list of the protocols and what indicators they're using to measure impacts on social and ecological impacts as well. Yeah. Great. Now, if that, that'll be, I think, very interesting to, to take a look at for folks. Uh, there were a couple of questions about <clears throat> whether there were patterns with respect to coastal versus offshore MPAs. Did you notice any patterns there? Uh, within the results, we did notice that um, the distance from shore, the mean, the average distance from shore was a significant variable. Um, so um, those MPAs that were further from shore had uh, more positive uh, impacts on fish populations. And so it is then, it, this is just an assumption, um, hypothesis, that um, MPAs are not that the terrestrial um, and human activities onshore could be having a much they have been strong impacts on MPAs as well as um, in protect, both protected and unprotected sites based on those results. Um, and so we, yes, we did notice that difference there. Here's a question um, asking, did you notice any variation in performance from where funding was sourced? So were you able to ask about uh, MPAs that received govern government funding versus perhaps funding from another uh, non-governmental source? No, that actually would be a good, <laughs> a good research topic. We did have data on who managed the, um, the MPA and for a sample we did not notice any significant difference. There was a slight difference there, um, whether it was state managed, shared management, or non-state management, um, but the difference was not significant. Um, but sources of funding could be an interesting, uh, an interesting explanatory factor as well. And uh, did you explore the development stage of the country and whether that played a role in the ecological success of the MPA, uh, developing countries compared to developed countries? Yes, um, neither um, GDP or the Human Development Index um, came out as significant. Um, they were not significantly correlated with any of the results. Uh, but um, I also add the caveat that a lot of our sample was in the developing world as well. So, um, but even so, we did those. The national, um, the national level indicators um, had very weak uh, explanatory power, and not this is not only from this work, but other work as well have found that um, national level 
indicators do not predict um, site level or local level processes very well in some cases. So a couple of questions on the data side from Tom Dallison. He's asking, uh, how during data collection did you overcome differences in methodologies, especially regarding biomass calculations from varying sources? If they, if they took a different approach to calculating biomass, how were you able to, uh, to reconcile or synthesize those? Yes, um, when we were doing the matching and comparing MPA to non-MPA sites, we only matched those that were from the same data set. Um, and so we ensured so that the difference in methodologies would not interfere with our calculations of response ratios. And so for each data set, uh, we listed and we described um, how they kept, how they, what species were were surveyed. Um, for almost all of the studies, we calculated the biomass data ourselves, or we were given we were given species level biomass data, and so we uh, we did the compiling ourselves. But in most cases, and in all cases, sorry, we did not um, compare. Um, fish populations that were collected with different methodologies. And here's a question from Charlie Wally asking, do you have a sense of whether a similar analysis could be done on other taxa, like invertebrates, or on a broader measure of biodiversity? Definitely. Um, if I had time, I would do it. <laughs> um, yes, the, the, method, the experimental design is something that is, can be replicated uh, for not only other types of but other types of interventions, other kinds of treatments or treatment effects that we're, we're looking at. And so um, uh, the other part of this work is to talk about and introduce these kind of methods that have been used in the health and development sector to understand the differences that they, when that their, their interventions make on um, development or health outcomes, we can use these methods uh, from impact evaluation and quasi-experimental procedures to get an understanding of the impacts of marine conservation and other types of conservation interventions on different types of outcomes, whether it be social or ecological. Uh then here's a question from Sarah Warden asking, would you expect these results to be similar for MPA networks and not just individual MPAs? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to tell. Um, that was something we were hoping to investigate, but um, we did not have the resources to be able to look at network effects separately in the study. But definitely it will be a very interesting uh, topic for further research. Yeah, these, these webinars are excellent for identifying all the things that you can do next. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a question from Orion McCarthy. Uh, getting back to the specifics about staff capacity in Figure 3, uh, you showed that monitoring and enforcement and management plans did not rank highly in terms of relative importance. But how do you, how do you separate out uh, staff capacity from the tasks needed uh, or the staff needed to conduct these tasks? Uh, like, like doing yeah. management plans or enforcement. Yes. Um, so in the assessments that where we got the data from, these were all separate indicators, and so the the respondents were asked about these topics separately, and so um, they when the question was about enforcement, it was about the the capacity to carry out enforcement activities. Um, they with regards to management plan. Um, if there isn't a management plan in place and um, it's, if it's being implemented. The, the other, the reason why the qualitative responses um, from the managers is also valuable, I think, is because, well, not only the managers, the stakeholders as well that responded, um, they have a, a sense of where are the gaps and it seems that they have a really strong sense of where the gaps are within the MPAs. Uh, we we don't make assumptions that all the MPAs are are the same, and every MPA differs. Um, and so we so in this um, the identity, I think this the, the linkage between what the what was said in the management assessments and the ecological data provides a strong testament that 
those that are involved in the management, whether it be the managers or stakeholders, have a really good understanding of where where the needs are. And so within the local context for each MPA, um, those that fill in these gaps where the needs are identified should, should be a priority. And again, these will differ from MPA to MPA. You mentioned the website, uh, mpamystery.org. Would you like to say a little bit more about that and what the hope is for that website, what the purpose is? Yes, and so that website is part of an ongoing initiative um, that has been the work of, it's a collaboration between many different uh, agencies, and it's been going on for um, four or more years. And basically, it's, it's the hopes is that it's, it's it acts as a portal to provide information on tools, resources, research, on how we can better understand and uncover the linkages between management and social and ecological processes within MPAs um, to provide that kind of support, not only in terms of tools, but to different ways that we, could, we should be thinking about understanding marine conservation and how we measure and understand their impacts and how we can um, better implement and design more effective and more equitable um, conservation initiatives. And so it's the mpamystery.org and you'll find um, quite a few resources, the type of projects that, were, that were, um, is, are being worked on, uh, some other related publications, um, as well as the monitoring protocols that are being used in some of the study sites uh, that you can download and, and and apply them to your local context. All right, I've got one more question here, and then I, I'm going to ask if people have any other questions. We've gotten through a lot of them so far. Uh, from Holly Buresh, she asks, when you look to the impact on fish, are you taking into consideration invasive species within MPAs? And are, all the, are these populations also increasing? Um, no, we, we did not look at species specific. Um, variations or differences, uh, but again, that's a, a very interesting topic for future research uh, um, where we can get a better sense of invasive species and their potential impacts as well and how that interacts with protection. So there are also a couple of other questions about um, ways in which this work could be expanded. Uh, one who's interested in seeing this uh, applied to areas beyond national jurisdiction or the high seas yes. and I think that would of course require that we have effective MPAs in the high seas which we <laughs> don't really have yet um, and then also yeah. an interest in comparing the data that you've gathered here with uh, locally managed marine areas and uh, whether whether that was considered as part of this work um, yes. of including areas that weren't strictly MPAs Yes, um, there were some locally managed marine areas in the data set, uh, but there were a few, there were very few. Um, so definitely looking more into how devolved governance and, um, plays a role in, in outcomes. And uh, for example, we had a, quite a few of the locally managed areas in Oceania, and unfortunately, um, they, in Oceania, very few, well, not very few, but less of the MPAs in Oceania had they were legally gazetted, and so um, these probably were those LMMAs um, where they did not have the legislative supports yet. However, um, they were much stronger in terms of inclusive decision making, and so um, many of these LMMAs could be providing that support for the the equitable environment for management that uh, many of the state-managed MPAs are not being able to do. And uh, we're definitely interested in to look at both the ecological and social outcomes from LMAs and seeing how that kind of devolved management plays a role in, in shaping outcomes. Well, I think we've gone through all the questions that have come in. So, David, I don't know if there's anything you would like to close in terms of giving us uh, your last words on the subject or, or the future work that you're engaged in right now. Yes, okay. So, um, just 
say thank you for coming out. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, my email address is there and Twitter handle. Um, and yeah, so the current work that I am doing for my postdoc of my Smith Fellowship is focusing on social outcomes and using some of the same impact evaluation and the uh, research and the experimental design that we applied for the ecological data. Uh, my hope is to apply some of those same techniques to understand social impacts. So can we harness the power of available data such as census or other economic data sources to understand how communities have changed over time since the establishment of an NPA? Um, these are some, that's one area that I'm hoping to pursue. Others, in, um, I will be looking at the literature, within the literature to see um, what is being said about the trade-offs that we see in NPAs. Trade-offs in terms of um, those, are, are there all win-wins in terms of social and ecological impacts? Or um, in cases where there are trade-offs, um, get a better understanding of why they occur and, and um, and as well, it was relating to equity, and so why or, or how do some groups benefit more, or and why do some groups benefit more than others when MPAs are established? And so we'll be looking at the literature to get a better understanding of um, synergies, trade-offs, and equity in marine conservation uh, for MPAs and other other types of marine interventions as well. Well, I just want to say, those of us involved in capacity building, when we see this, this headline about how capacity shortfalls are hindering the performance of marine protected areas globally, we think, well, of course. <laughs> um, but I just want to thank you and your co-PIs for this really excellent work um, beyond the, the intuitive to really show us the data and lay it out for us. And I'm really happy to see that that work is continuing on the social science side. So. Thanks very much, and thanks for joining us today. And uh, for all you who joined us, the, the webinar will be posted on the Open Channels website. So if you missed any part of it or want to share it, please go there, and, uh, and the PowerPoint will be posted on the MPA Center website. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you, David. Thank you.